especially when he did the visual demonstration of um, how he held the gun uh, according to his version of the story and um, I, my heart just bleeds for them. Tonight, everyone waits for the jury and their verdict in the Gerald Stanley murder trial in Battleford, Saskatchewan. I will be working with the mayor. I will be guiding her. A Cree woman in Montreal becomes the city's first commissioner of Indigenous Affairs. For me, it is very important that we continue this for our children. And Flicker Dance brings together traditional Gitsan and the contemporary. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. The Gerald Stanley trial in Battleford is now in the hands of the jury. The seven women, five man jury must decide Stanley's fate for the death of Colton Bushy. APTN's Chris Stewart has the latest. Today is the first full day of deliberations for the jury. The group deliberated after hearing closing arguments until 9 p.m. last night. They wanted to hear replays of both Sheldon and Gerald Stanley's testimony starting from the first gunshot. It was decided that they would hear both Sheldon and Gerald Stanley's full testimony beginning this morning. Outside the courthouse, a small group of Bushy family supporters continued to brave wind chills of minus 30 supporters from both the Indigenous and non-Indigenous community. Like, I, I think it's important to come down and, and show support because um, I, I see on Facebook and I see all the negative all the negative comments. Your jacket. I see all the negative comments that, that, that like, like, oh, he's a thief and this and that and everything and, you know, but like, I, I, I don't even know the, the entire story, but I know that it's, it, like, I, I, I don't believe that someone has the right to shoot another person if they, if, if for any reason. I really sympathize with um, the difficulties. I know it's extremely hard for a victim's family to have to sit through a trial. Um, it's very uh, emotional to have to relive all the experiences that happened and hear them and especially when he did the visual demonstration of um, how he held the gun uh, according to his version of the story and um, I, my heart just bleeds for them. It just really breaks for them. After rehearing both the testimony from Sheldon and Gerald Stanley, the jury is once again deliberating. They have the option of acquittal, of convicting him of second degree murder or manslaughter. The jury will be working into the evenings and weekends. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Battleford, Saskatchewan. Now to Treaty 1, where today marked the end of the second week in the trial for the murder of Tina Fontaine in Winnipeg. 55-year-old Raymond Cormier has pleaded not guilty to second-degree murder. The court heard from a former friend of Cormier who testified he witnessed a fight between the teen and the accused. Brittany Hobson brings us more. Court heard more details about an argument between Tina Fontaine and her accused killer, Raymond Cormier, weeks before her body was pulled from a Winnipeg River. Tyrell Morrison told jurors he heard this 15-year-old and Cormier arguing outside the home he shared with his then fiance Sarah Holland. On Thursday, Holland told court the fight occurred on August 6, 2014, two days before Fontaine was last seen leaving a downtown hotel. Both Holland and Morrison testified to using drugs with Cormier. Morrison said Fontaine came to the home twice, the first time with her boyfriend and Cormier, the second time she came by herself. We heard her knock at the door. She came in crying. Morrison testified Cormier came to the home later that day with a stolen truck and tools. He helped move the tools out of the back of the truck. Sometime after, Fontaine and Cormier began to argue. Morrison says he couldn't hear what the two were saying. The argument lasted approximately 10 minutes. I remember her taking off, screaming down the streets. That was the last time he saw Fontaine. A couple weeks later, he heard about Fontaine's death through Facebook. During testimony, Morrison said Cormier seemed shocked and surprised when he told him the news. Court was told earlier in the trial, police confiscated a stolen blue truck and tested it for DNA. Morrison's DNA was found in it. He told police he may have cut himself while moving some of the stolen tools. During cross-examination, defense lawyer Tony Cavanaugh suggested Morrison could have been involved in Fontaine's death. You had equal opportunity to assault or harm Tina Fontaine. Morrison said no. The trial is expected to run another three more weeks. Brittany Hobson, ABTN National News, Winnipeg. 
and we would like to hear what you have to say about this or any other story, here's how to contact us. Send an email to news at aptn.ca, like our APTN National News Facebook page. Follow us on Twitter at APTN News or go to our website, aptnnews.ca. A Saskatchewan man who's coping with the death of his partner is sharing his story of love, loss and addiction. Patrick Lavallee stood beside Marlene Bird through the course of her traumatic recovery from a brutal attack. She passed away last November. Now Lavallee is working to overcome a world of poverty and addiction of his own. We get more from CTV. You're going to take care of me today. Oh, yes. It's been a tough few months for Patrick Lavalley, having to say goodbye to his partner Marlene Bird after she took her last breath in November. I didn't think I'd ever love somebody that much. Bird was a victim of a brutal attack. Her attacker Leslie Black sexually assaulted her and set her on fire. Both of her legs had to be amputated. Lavalley recalls the day he found out about Bird's attack. He says he was in Edmonton at the time, but he knew he had to get back to take care of her. He says he liked caring for Bird because she was nice to him, even when he did something wrong. This was a nice one. I, I like this one. Now, four years later, Lavallee is finally taking care of himself. I thank God that I, you know, I get to see another day sober without a hangover and not worrying about or am I going to get my next fix? Lavallee struggled with alcohol addiction since he was a teen. He tried getting sober several times before, but there was always something holding him back. I guess when you, when you drink with somebody so many years, you want to go back into that drinking. And an addictions counselor says that's not uncommon, saying addiction is a family disease. That goal that you want to achieve um, becomes more and more elusive and you and you ask yourself why why am I why am I fighting so hard for that when you know my loved one just wants me to be the same but now Lavalli is celebrating three months sober he started attending treatment and going for counseling his sister Linda Lavalli says she has seen such an improvement in him both physically and mentally I can see the glimpse of the, the brother that I used to have now. Uh, from back when we used to go skidooing on the ice and get lost on the ice and do everything together, I see him uh, again. The Valley says he's looking forward to taking care of himself one day at a time. He says he plans on staying in Timber Bay because that's where he feels closest to his sweetie, Marlene Bird. Stephanie Vlela, CTV News, Prince Albert. The city of Montreal is taking one more step towards reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Today, the mayor presented the city's new Commissioner of Indigenous Affairs. Danielle Rochette reports. A Cree lawyer from West Wenipi, Marie-Ève Bordelot, just made history. She'll be working closely with the mayor of Montreal as the city's new Commissioner of Indigenous Affairs. I can see uh, two very important tasks. The first one is that I will be working with the mayor. I will be guiding her with everything, any questions that comes and that, that can affect the Indigenous peoples. Um, the, uh, the second very important mandate that I do have is to, to draft, to develop that uh, reconciliation strategy. Mayor Valérie Plante says this new position will help help our administration build bridges with indigenous people in the city. When we talk about reconciliation, to me it's about acknowledging, celebrating, but also moving forward. How do we make sure that Aboriginal people, whatever you're a young one, an elder, a family that decides to live in Montreal, that you can fully participate to society into Montreal's life. And that goes through housing, how do you find a job, how do you, uh, your culture is being uh, celebrated and recognized. So this is all part of that and this is why Madame Bordelot is going to be supporting me. A key part of Bordelot's three-year mandate is to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. 
UNDRIP was endorsed by the City of Montreal in August 2017. I really need to work with the different uh, First Nations indigenous uh, communities and, um, and governments in order to see and to understand exactly what has to be done within the City of Montreal and its territory to be fully able to implement uh, th that UN DRIP. Bordelot will also develop a training program for city staff and elected members. It will include indigenous history and how it relates to the 35,000 Aboriginal people living in the big city. Daniel Rochette, APTN National News, Montreal. Some youth in Whitehorse received a baseball lesson of a lifetime as members of the Toronto Blue Jays came to play ball. That story and more coming up after the break. Here's a look at Saturday's weather forecast starting on the east coast. A cloudy high of plus 5 in Halifax, 6 above and snow in Fredericton. Sunny and minus 10 in Happy Valley, Goose Bay and Cartwright. Snow across much of Quebec, minus 5 in Montreal, minus 13 in Shibugamu. A grey day in southern Ontario and now in minus 4 in Toronto and Peterborough. Snow and minus 5 in Ottawa. Minus 12 in Capus Casing and Thunder Bay, minus 10 in Wawa. In northern Manitoba, minus 24 under the sun in Churchill. Minus 13 in Barron's River, Dauphin, Gimli Harbour and Winnipeg. Over to Saskatchewan, minus 11 in Saskatoon and North Battleford. Minus 17 in Uranium City, minus 19 in Stony Rapids. Welcome back. Youth from Northern Ontario are meeting in Thunder Bay for three days. Over 100 youth traveled from all over NAN territory for the conference. Anishinaabe Aski Nation represents 49 First Nations, most of them remote. The participants will take part in activities that focus on cultural teachings. Winona Gangyon sits on the NAN Youth Council. Bringing them back to the culture because of the residential schools and because of like all the things the settlers try to do to assimilate us, it really, you know, it really stripped away of our, our identity. But uh, within the youth now, they're starting to take interest of what was lost, and they're really starting to fight back. Learning to play baseball has a whole new meaning for some Yukon students. That's because representatives from the Toronto Blue Jays threw a few pitches in Whitehorse to teach the youth about leadership skills and how that can lead to reconciliation. Shirley McLean has more. Being a leader is knowing who's who on your team and those skills are being tested with the name game. It's a fun game but learning how to build and maintain a team are skills these grade 7 students are being taught at this rookie league leadership camp. How to be a coach, how to be a leader, how to teach younger people how to do stuff, reconciliation, how to work as a team, and most of all baseball. What do we do first, what do we do the first thing in rookie league? Stretch. Remember the wave? We stretch. Lauren Simonson is with J-Care, the charitable foundation of the Toronto Blue Jays. She says baseball is a game of resiliency. So in baseball, if you fail 7 out of 10 times, you're going to be in the Hall of Fame. So you succeed 30% of the time, you're going to be a Hall of Famer in baseball. So we talk a lot to the kids in our programs about how uh, we, all, we all have challenges in life and we all fail at different things in life and we have to pick ourselves back up. And so baseball is sort of a really, really good analogy when it comes to that for kids. There's more being taught than baseball skills. Lessons of inclusion, fair play and other workshops to understand the cultural gaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth. For Lewis Thompson, learning about the legacy of Indian residential school is helping him to understand that life is a game of resiliency. My grandma went to residential school and then she had, she had my mom and then my mom had a hard life. Maybe his grandma went to residential school and gave his mom a hard life and took it out on him and then she started to drink and then he got taken away from his family. The rookie camp is hosted by the Yukon Child and Youth Advocate Annette King. She saw this as a good fit to answer some of the TRC's calls to action that call for funding for youth programs to learn about reconciliation and for youth to be engaged in sports. 
Now kids know so much more and it's all about repairing that harm and I think this is the generation we want to see integrating um, play and culture and moving forward without that pain and suffering and racism and, and separation. For Zach Golden, he's not sure what reconciliation means, but he says he's learning how to be a leader. You have to be nicer to people. You can't be rude. You can't show, or shut them out, and you just have to include everybody. The youth will take their skills from rookie camp back to their own schools and set up similar programs for children in younger grades. Shirley McLean, EPTN National News, Whitehorse. Dance is universal and can be shared across language and cultural barriers. A company from BC has set out to share their traditional dance with a modern flair. Beverly Andrews caught up with them at a performance in Toronto. The dance of the northwest coast of British Columbia has been brought to life in Flickr by the dancers of Dam Lahamed. The Vancouver-based dance company has been touring this piece across Quebec, is now in Toronto. It's a piece that brings together uh, a, the traditional Gixan dance form, also bringing in contemporary elements. Although the inspiration for Flickr is based in tradition, the story, regalia, songs and choreography are newly created use this, I call it a vocabulary of language, a vocabulary of movements that are grounded in our traditional art form, and we use that to, to tell that story, that contemporary story that we're wanting to, to bring to life onto the stage. The members of Dancers of Dam Lahamed are family. Two generations are performing in this piece alone. The family performs and travels together, creating and collaborating with elders, artists and other dancers from around the world. For me, it is very important that we continue this for our children so that they can grow up being proud of who they are, knowing who they are. After this tour, Margaret Grenier will be directing the Coastal First Nation Dance Festival in Vancouver at the end of February. Beverly Andrews, APTN National News, Toronto. A group of NWT stone carvers are hoping to pass along cultural knowledge to newcomers in the territory. Our reporter Charlotte Mark ja Mort Jacobs has more. From a giant marble slab to a smooth soapstone masterpiece, the North is a treasure trove of traditional art. Now three well-known NWT carvers are opening up their space to share the craft. There's nobody in Yellowknife that's doing workshops for carvings. And um, that might be a great thing for tourists to do, like in their free time. This would be a good, good way for them to sit down and um, learn, and learn of our culture and learn of um, the work, the soapstone carvings that we do. This month, Daryl Taylor and Eli Nazagadlewick of Tuktaaktuk and John Sabaran of Fort Simpson banded together to launch the Frozen Rock Studio in Yellowknife. With the hum of tools and clouds of dust, these artists hope to carve out a space for hands-on learning in tourism. You don't really have to draw. You just need the courage to come and try something new. Well, I think people come here um, learning some of the history and, and, and some of the um, ways of um, Yellowknife, but they really don't are not really in full contact with um, local people of, of the north. Aurora tourism is on the rise in Yellowknife, seeing an increase of one quarter in just this last year alone. Frozen Stone Studio is hoping to partner with tour operators to expand on Aurora tourism. But Nazigalowicz says working as an artist full-time in Yellowknife does not come without challenges. One of the difficulties is having other workshops and why they haven't come up is the infrastructure, like uh, a place to even um, have a workshop, so infrastructure, finance, and um, trying to get backing. The group also hopes that workshop participants will take away more than just tactical skills. We're sharing with them our livelihood of uh, our p parents uh, from generations back that are nomadic and um, 
and in the evenings they would sit and carve and uh, make tools and and that turned into uh, an art form later on in life. Charlotte Mart Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. Some great looking work there. An all new episode of APTN Investigates airs tonight. We've got a preview for you coming up right after the break. Here's the rest of Saturday's weather forecast. Picking back up in northern Alberta, minus 13 in High Level in Fort Chippewan. Sunny and minus 5 in Medicine Hat, minus 6 under the sun in Lethbridge. Beautiful looking day on the west coast, plus 5 in Victoria, Vancouver and Campbell River. Minus 8 under the sun in Prince George, a sunny 15 below in Dease Lake. A cool day across Yukon, minus 32 in Dawson City, minus 29 in Old Crow. Over to NWT, minus 15 in Fort Liard and Fort Simpson. Minus 26 in Saks Harbor, minus 23 in Politak and Colville Lake. In Nunavut, sunny and minus 40 in Repulse Bay. Minus 36 in Chesterfield, minus 38 in Iqaluit. And the cold spot is Igloo Look at minus 41. Welcome back. A young woman dies by suicide after returning to a tiny northern community and her family is looking for answers. Tonight on the APTN Investigates episode North of Hope, Charlotte Mort Jacobs looks into the story from Fort Simpson NWT. Here's a preview. On the surface, the remote town of Fort Simpson, traditionally known as Liliqui, appears peaceful. But this isolated community in the Decho region of the Northwest Territories is in turmoil. For the last six months, APTN has visited Liliqui, searching for the root causes, consequences, and healing needed to address hardships for youth in the North. Youth North of Hope. Back in spring 2017, six people in this area took their lives over the span of four months. Four of them right here in Fort Simpson. The coroner ruled all of their deaths as suicide, but for the families and friends, each fell through the cracks of an inadequate mental health safety net. Only a month into her summer vacation, Melissa was relentlessly bullied. I think at home it was probably the safest place you could possibly be because no one's going to go there, but then you still have your phone with you, and I think that was the only portal they had to attack you at that time. Researchers argued that the larger systemic inequalities experienced by Indigenous people across Canada can lead to an increase in bullying. Thompson Simpson Secondary High School, where Melissa went, had a zero-tolerance policy towards the mistreatment of students. But did it really address the bullying? The bully follows the kid through their entire life in a small northern community, and it's very hard to respond to that because it's so spread out or so insidious. And you can watch that whole episode tonight right here in just a few minutes. And that is your APTN National News for this Friday. For news anytime, including the latest in the Gerald Stanley trial as we await a verdict, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great night.